Okay, this is chapter nine of uh, how to prevent dementia, poor man's way to prevent dementia and the raise IQ by me. Uh, we're gonna be talking about fats and lipid peroxidation and we're gonna talk about the Yamashima theory. He's a Japanese neuroscientist and uh, he's got, he's really interesting. Uh, he, was, he was given the job, well, why are so many Japanese people becoming demented? And the reason is because they're now taking on a westernized type of diet with a lot of fat, with a lot of oils, but he, uh, sorts it out in more detail than that. So just briefly, here's what a fatty acid is. It's a carboxylic acid. So you have a carbon with a you know carbonyl bond to the oxygen, a double bond to the oxygen, then there's a hydroxyl group right there. This part of the fatty acid is polar, has a charge to it, because the electronegativity of oxygen is rather different than carbon. Oxygen wants to grab electrons. That's what electronegativity is much more than carbon does. Uh, that being polar, having a charge difference between the two molecules makes it soluble in water. Water is also called aqueous solution. The remainder of the fatty acid right here is the carbon and hydrogen tail. That is nonpolar because the electronegativity of the hydrogens is very similar to that of carbon. You know, carbon is about 2.5, the hydrogen is about 2.1, so they're very similar such that they're not polar and they, they don't... Um, dissolve on their own in uh, aqueous water solution, okay? This side of the carbon is the methyl end, and this is where we count um, for the, where the double bond is uh, to determine if it's an omega-3 or an omega-6. So an omega-3 fat would have a double bond at the three carbon, an omega-6 fat would have a double bond at the six carbon. This fat right here, because it is uh, saturated with hydrogens, meaning that there's no double bonds, this would be saturated fat. In fact, this is the most common saturated fat in the human body called palmitic acid. So C16 having 16 carbons, and then the zero there indicates there's no double bonds. All right. Um, this is the hydrophobic nonpolar part. This is the polar part. And also notice that the fatty acid is sort of two things. It's part polar, part nonpolar. And the word for that is amphipathic. Amphi like an amphibi amphibi <laughs> amphibian. It can live in water and on land. And that's important because there's some molecules that intentionally are made to be amphipathic, like amphibians. They are can be part aqueous and uh, part hydrophobic, you know, in a, being soluble in an oil solution. The relevance is that's what emulsifiers are. Emulsifiers, and it's also used in soaps because they can pull something out of the lipid part of the solution, the oil part of the solution, and pull it into the aqueous solution. So that's how a soap can be used to wash grease off yourself. But that's also how emulsifiers are chemicals that are put into processed food to kind of hold the different phases of the food together, you know, when there's an aqueous and an oil phase in the food. So you're going to hear about those a lot. And emulsifiers are a big deal because they cause leaky gut. Detergents are a big deal because they can cause leaky gut. They can disrupt plasma membrane. Plasma membranes are primarily these hydrophobic fatty acids. Okay, I'll show you some more. Okay, so here's a little more detail about the structure of fatty acids. We're just going through the part that you're going to end up needing to know because you're going to hear discussion of these things. You're going to hear about these things all the time in nutrition. So here's a saturated fat. There's no double bonds. That means every carbon is attached to hydrogens. Each, each carbon can bind to four things. So you can see this carbon, for example, has a bond to another carbon and another carbon. Therefore, it'll have two hydrogens, one, two, all right? Here's a MUFA, monounsaturated fatty acid. And the classic monounsaturated fatty acid is with olive oil, okay? Uh, so there's just one double bond. And here's a PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid. That means it's got two or more double bonds. All right, this one would be, here's the methyl end. So we count to the six carbons. So this is an omega-6 fat, okay? Usually there'll be an intervening carbon before the next double bond. And this carbon, a carbon with two hydrogens on it, it's called a methylene. A methylene carbon and it's called actually the methylene bridge between where the double bonds are located and this ends up being highly relevant because this methylene bridge carbon has only a weak grab on its electrons and this hydrogen can be snatched off it rather easily the more double bonds a molecule has the easier it is to snatch these hydrogens off and initiate lipid peroxidation reactions and this is another reason why I'm not a big fan of this idea of giving omega-3 supplements with these long algae, um, real long uh, PUFAs. Because the longer the PUFA and the more double bonds on it, the more prone it is to getting undergoing lipid peroxidation, like with DHA and EPA, for example, from fish oil and whatnot. I don't believe in that stuff. I think that's nonsense. Okay, 
the omega end, also called W end or the N end. Okay, and that's again where we're counting these from. Um, and then we, yeah, we talked about this being the methylene bridge. So that's what you need to know about fatty acids. You need to know sat fat, MUFA, olive oil, PUFA, omega sixes, PUFAs, and omega three PUFAs. Okay, and there's also trans fats, but this is all that you're, you're probably going to hear about. There's, there's, there's always more in biology and medicine and nutrition, but the relevant point is what do you need to know? You need to know sat fat's bad for you. <laughs> Actually, MUFAs, they're all bad for you. You don't, you, The small amount of omega-3s you get and omega-6s in, in plant foods, that's all you need. I, I Just so you know, I don't subscribe to this, oh, you need omega-3s or you're going to become demented. I think that's all nonsense, okay? All these healthy populations, they didn't go take an omega-3 supplements. I think that's just something said by people who want to sell it to you. Okay, these are the types of fatty acid. And yeah, and the olive oil is not pure MUFA. It's also typically got somewhere in the ballpark, you know, like about 11 to 14% fat fat, sat fat. It's got a good amount of omega-6 fats. And like I said, every profitable food has a bodyguard of lies. Industry funded fake studies uh, to make their food product look good. Scientists are poor and they, they don't get as much funding um, as they used to from grants ever since around 1980-85 or so. So what that means is the scientists are desperate. And basically, you know, when, when a big food company calls them and says, hey, can you give us a study showing the benefits of our product? They say yes, and they will make that product look good. If they don't make the product look good, they don't ever get a second job. So most of the scientific articles in modern journals are bogus. And that's why I think you have to be intelligent and you have to be honest in order to read them effectively. And you have to use common sense. And the stuff from the old days, it's kind of simplistic in some ways. They didn't have as much fancy equipment, but they wanted to know the truth and they tell the truth and they did the best they could with what was available to them. And that's why most of the time that information's better. And that's also why I love Pritikin. Pritikin went through all that literature and he summarized it and the guy's a genius and he writes real clear. And there's a lot could be learned from him. I enjoyed reading all his books. All right, so anyways, here's a PUFA, polyunsaturated fatty acid, you know, counting from the methyl end, the omega end, um, you've got it on carbon-6, a double bond, so it's omega-6 fat. And here's the hydrogen on the methylene bridge carbon in between where the two double bonds are. The hydrogen gets plucked off, now you're stuck with a free radical, meaning an electron in an unpaired outer orbital that becomes highly reactive. An oxygen will bind to it here, and then two oxygens in a row attached to the molecule, that's called a peroxide. And then this will typically react with adjacent molecules and cause a chain reaction that's very damaging to the membrane. All right, So that's what lipid peroxidation is, because these are fats. That's what the lipid comes from. Peroxides, that's with the oxygens, two oxygens in a row is a peroxide. So these can be very damaging to plasma membranes. They can lead to damage of DNA. They can lead to damage of protein. And this is, again, why I'm not a big fan you know, of these PUFA supplements. You already got to put them into a radio pay container and just get them into the fridge right away. <laughs> so you really want that stuff heating up. And then when the company makes it, a lot of times these things undergo lipid peroxidation just from being made. And that's why I also think you really want to avoid these toxic oils. You know, um, Lipid peroxidation will produce something called hydroxynonanol. I'll show you the structure of it right now. This is something you do want to know about. You're going to hear about hydroxynonanol a lot, and it's actually a perfect name. So 4-hydroxy, because on the carbon number 4, you have a hydroxyl group. OH is a hydroxyl group, sometimes called an alcohol group. Known is N-O-N, and that means 9 carbons. So there's 9 carbons on it. Ene means a double bond. Here's a double bond in it. Al means aldehyde, meaning there's just a, hydroxy, a hydrogen attached to the carbonyl carbon. Okay, and this is hydroxynonanol, and it's just usually abbreviated H-N-E. And it's a very toxic aldehyde, does a lot of destruction, and it's produced by lipid peroxidation. Okay, so another reason why I say keep your fats low and wait till we get to Tetsumori Yamashima's work. Okay. All right, so hydroxynonanol in and of itself can inhibit ATP synthase on the inner mitochondrial membrane. So this is a mitochondria. Here's the outer mitochondrial membrane, OMM, inner mitochondrial membrane, usually abbreviated IMM. These are the complexes, these ones pump protons into the intramembranous space, intramembranous between the outer and the inner mitochondrial membrane, and they pump all these protons to establish a gradient, then the gradient is harvested by allowing a, a hydrogen to come back through the ATP synthase, and the energy of that uh, passing back into where it wants to be to equilibrate to where it has a lower concentration, 
that enables a phosphate to be added to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, to make adenosine triphosphate, as in three of them. And that's like the $20 bill in a cell, the currency of energy. Okay, so HNE can block that. Not good. All right, now we're getting into something kind of fancy here. Now we're getting into Tetsumori Yamashima's theory. Okay, Tetsumori Yamashima was a Japanese neuroscientist, and he was given the task, why are so many Japanese people coming to Mendo? This is a new thing. Okay, and this, we have to put a lot of stuff here together, but we can do it pretty fast. And here's the first thing you got to know. You need to know that HSP means heat, heat shock protein. Oh, by the way, when I was a resident, I, you know, I'd have to cover the emergency room uh, sometimes for, for reading films. And then we'd get a, f a film of a bone, like a plain film of the hand, the, the wrist or something. And the history often was HSP. And so I said to the senior resident, what's HSP? And he says, hurt self pain. And I'm like, well, that's a BS history. I would like a little more information than that. Does it hurt medial or lateral? You know, where do you think the, the problem site is? So anyways, HSP in the human body, though, means um, heat shock proteins. So these heat shock proteins do a couple different things. First of all, they, they function as chaperones. When a protein becomes dysfunctional, they will grab onto it and they will escort it over to the lysosome. The lysosome is the recycling area inside of a cell. Inside of that lysosome, there are powerful enzymes like cathepsin protease. So protease is chops up proteins. And then you can take the individual constituent amino acids and recycle them and use them to make other proteins. Okay. Now, if there's simultaneously other problems inside the cell, like the calcium is too high, the cytoplasm calcium, and that can be something from excessive glutamate, um, excitotoxins, psychological stress, caffeine, sleep deprivation, opening up of voltage-gated calcium channels by EMF, um, you know, ingesting um, excitotoxins like MSG, manufactured free glutamate, aspartame. Um, all of these things contribute to an excitotoxic effect whereby cytoplasm calcium gets too high. That also happens when you have decreased ATP production because you don't have enough energy to pump calcium out of the cytoplasm. That also happens when you have circa inhibitors, okay, because they're part of the process to get that calcium out of the cell. We're going to get into this in more detail later, this calcium stuff, but just so you've heard of it now, calcium is like the on-off switch of a cell. And if it gets too high, the cell is overactivated, and the cell is going to need tons of ATP energy to compensate for that. That's why mitochondrial inhibitors are a disaster for neurons, because they need tons of energy. And if they don't have that energy, the cell can go into apoptosis, program cell death. Okay, so what Tetsumori Yamashima is talking about here is heat shock proteins have two very important jobs. They need to escort these uh, dysfunctional uh, proteins to be recycled, and they also stabilize the lysosome so its powerful proteolytic enzymes don't leak out and cause damage in the cell. All right, so what happens though is when you have hydroxynonanol, HNE, accumulating inside of a neuron, it will bind to the heat shock proteins and it distorts their shape. Once their shape is distorted, they now become very attractive to an enzyme called calpane. And calpane is a great name because it's it's activated by increased calcium and it causes pain. It causes painful problems in the cell. And it's a protease, so it will chop up the heat shock protein once it, when it's bound to H and E. And now that's a disaster in the cell. It creates a cascade of problems whereby the heat shock proteins no longer can escort the proteins. They can't stabilize the lysosome. The lysosome breaks apart. Cathepsin comes out, and it starts to just destroy things in the cell. The cell dies. Goes into apoptosis. And this is the Tetsumori Yamashima. Uh, calpane cathepsin uh, theory of neurodegeneration. Okay, so the, what's the point of this? Don't eat omega-6 cooking oils. If it has any oil in it, don't eat it. As uh, you know, Caldwell Essenson says, no oil, not one drop. They're all bad. Olive oil is bad. Don't let anybody tell you olive oil is good. They're all bad. Okay, and and that's an important thing to know. And, you know, you want to deal with reality. If you want to get the best results, you just have to deal with reality, okay? And there's plenty of studies showing this. And, you know, you know, you look at Dr. McDougall. He'll tell you, too, all oils are bad. In Dr. McDougall's word, the two major toxins are animal foods and, uh, and cooking oils, okay? They're all bad. That's an important thing to get through your head because I know you get confused because uh, you hear contradictory things. All right, so we talked about, that's how you spell his name, Yamashima, Tetsumori Yamashima. And yeah, here's one of his papers, if you want to read one of his papers. He wrote a book, too, about cooking oils, but here's uh, one of his papers you can read pretty quick. Implications of cooking oil, 
and peroxidation, lipid peroxidation product, hydroxynonanol, for Alzheimer's disease. Okay, and so the reason why it's relevant to Alzheimer's disease is um, it can destroy neurons in the um, hippocampus causing memory problems. It can destroy neurons in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, the hunger center, if you will, causing difficulty in regulating one's appetite. It can cause destruction of pancreatic beta cells and thus decrease the ability of the body to produce insulin. So it's a big deal. Okay, then he also gets into some of the issues with regard to alcohol. And persons who have um, inability to digest alcohol, they're especially vulnerable to cooking oils, very vulnerable to it. A lot of Asian persons are. I forget the exact percent, but they're super vulnerable to these cooking oil-induced uh, neurotoxic effects. Okay, I'm not going to read through every word because also sort of my, and by the way, I recommend don't drink any alcohol at, at all. And so sort of my approach with this book was, what I was trying to do with this book was to show you lots of the pictures because I've written plenty of books before and some of my other books, I didn't know how to draw on them before. And I actually think my writing in some of my other books is actually significantly better than this because I, I had time to do it and the, plo, the prose would flow and I'd make lots of jokes. I had a lot of fun writing those books. Versus on this book, I cranked it out as fast as I could because I had to. I didn't have a lot of time. But what I did uniquely about it was I put all these pictures in there. So there's just tons and tons of pictures. And I think, you know, it's easier to remember the picture. And usually the, the big key points, you know, the academic orgasm points, the AOs, the eureka moments, those quite often can be encapsulated in a picture. So that's easier to remember. Okay, so what else am I saying here? Never drink alcohol. I think alcohol is stupid. You know, why do you want to do something that's going to damage your brain cells? You know, being drunk means that you've damaged your brain. I mean, why is that cool? It's stupid. Okay, and I look at alcoholic brains. They're all shrunken and shriveled. They look kind of disgusting. They look much older. Like a 40-year-old alcoholic, their brain will look like an 80-year-old. You don't want that. Okay, um, let's see. All fat is bad. When I say all fat is bad, what I mean is you don't want to seek out any fat. You get enough fat just by eating regular low-fat plant foods. They're in there. Their omega-3s are in there. The omega-6s are in there. Okay, you don't need to go looking for them. Supplementation with omega-3 fats is associated with increased risk of prostate cancer, potentially immune suppression, potentially increased risk of metastatic cancer spread. There's been studies showing that in animals. No, I don't think it's a good idea. Okay, oh yeah, and then I got some Greek friends, and you know, all the Greeks love olive oil, and the whole legend of Odysseus, you know, when he was out in the, in the Trojan uh, event and then he had come home, he wanted to get back with his wife Penelope. Their bed was built around an olive tree. So my Greek friends, they don't like it when I criticize olive oil. And they don't like it sometimes with my Italian friends too if I criticize the Mediterranean diet. I'm like, it's nothing personal. I'm just trying to talk about what's healthy for people. Um, let's see. Because now what I'm doing here, I'm kind of scrolling through... Um, some of the comments and this is a little bit more of a text part of the book which it doesn't translate as well on the internet you know maybe one of these days I'll, I'll read through the text parts but the gist of it is there's a lot of problems with olive oil and, and companies can set up a short-term study to make it look like their product is good whatever product it is we call this reductionist science um, all right so there's plenty of problems with it when I would what I would write I'd often write dialogues kind of like a platonic dialogue or dialectic if you will and I would have characters in there like Plant Man, Prometheus. I was just having kind of fun with that stuff. Okay, it also impaired vasodilation. Um, let's see. So sorry, I'm going to scroll through these a little bit. I think I got some more pictures coming up in a moment. Oh yeah, and I, I've had friends like Indian doctor friend who had a mild cardiac infarction, had to be defibrillated, and then he came out of it just fine. And I couldn't understand it. The guy's totally skinny and healthy looking and energetic, but turns out that he cooks with a lot of oil. And I think that's why he had a myocardial infarction. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, there's been other studies, too, that I got some of the, the, the stuff listed here is, you know, whatever fat they eat, they're all atherogenic. All these dietary fats are atherogenic, okay? Even if you get a transient decrease in your triglycerides with omega-3, you're eating fat. Fat makes you fat. It's very, it's the most caloric dense thing in the world, these uh, fatty oils. <laughs> and I don't think nuts are a good idea. I agree with Esselstyn. You want to minimize your dietary fat. Okay, um, let's see here. Okay, that was just going back over. You know, the only thing that prevents coronary artery disease is the low-fat diet. 
all this other stuff, stents, pills, surgery, they don't cure it. They never cure it. Okay. Um, yeah, let's see here. I went through all this. See, what I'm doing here is I'm scrolling through the text part, which I think is not too necessary to go through on the book. Okay, here's the giant uh, fatty acids that I think are a bad idea. Um, so EPA, eicosapentaenoic acid, that's, um, you know, 20 carbons with five double bonds. Five double bonds means a lot of room for um, lipid peroxidation. All right, just two double bonds will increase your risk of double lipid peroxidation. You got five of them, that's a big increased risk. And then there's DHA, that's got six double bonds. I think that's a really bad idea. And, you know, these are, are especially, you know, used by cold water fish so they don't freeze. Humans, theoretically at least, came from a warmer environment. Theoretically at least, our so-called primate cousins, they, uh, they don't eat fish. <laughs> they eat plant foods. Uh, not that I actually think we're that close to chimps. That gets into a whole other discussion. I made videos about it before. I actually think we're very different than chimps. And I kind of made the joke that if you see a chimp walking by a... You know, it doesn't even cross your mind that you would want to sleep with it, okay? When a woman crosses a man's path, he can't help it. His brain automatically says, would you sleep with her, yes or no? Okay, when a chimp crosses your path, you just want to, you know, run for safety. You don't even, it doesn't even cross your mind would you sleep with it or not. It's so different than us. All that stuff about chimps being so similar to us, I think, is nonsense. Two twin girls, sisters, okay? They're, you know, they're 5% different from each other at least, okay? So the idea that a chimp is like us except for 1% or 2%, that's nonsense, okay? We, that's, we can get into DNA. I made separate videos about that. I'm not going to get into that right now. I'm just looking at all this text. So this is a big text segment of the book. Um, so triglyceride is just three fatty acids bound to a glycerol molecule, and that'll be abbreviated TAG. That's worth knowing because sometimes there will only be two fatty acids attached to the glycerol, and that will be a DAG, as in diacylglycerol. So acyl just means like fatty acid for our, our purposes. Glycerol is the backbone, three carbons, you know, kind of like propane triol, three carbon alkane with uh, three alcohol groups on it. Okay, most of the fat that we eat is in the form of triglycerides. Okay, um... So this is just going to be, you know, probably more information than you want about fatty acids. So if you actually decide to read the book and you want to learn more about fatty acids, you'll find a lot of textual information on there. Oh, Nathan Pritikin, who reviewed all the literature on lipids written up to his day, said fat is bad. And I agree with him based on my study of the literature. I read all of Nathan Pritikin's stuff and a whole bunch of other stuff. I went through all the biochem books, read a whole bunch of papers on lipid, and I come to the same conclusion. And that's what I think an unbiased, correct conclusion is. Uh, when you eat more fat, you get more bile acids going down into your colon. Okay. Um, also, the more fat a person is eating, typically the less fiber they're eating, and that predisposes them to leaky gut. Uh, you really need that fiber. Oh, this is another thing I wrote about. How does meat increase the risk of cancer? Meat increases the risk of cancer in so many ways, it's not even funny. We don't need to go into it all now. I've made videos about it before, but I remember coming up with about 30 reasons why meat increases the risk of cancer. I only put 17 of them right there. Okay, that's it for now. Uh, next chapter, we'll do leaky gut. Um, hope that information about fat and lipid peroxidation and Tetsumori Yamashima's um, uh, theory of lipid peroxidation leading to hydroxynonanol and how that uh, damages neuron was uh, of interest to you.